Great to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Um, especially, I have to say, this conference is clearly already very well organised because it was at a time of year when I could go walking with Bettina before the conference and see lots of flowers. It's a beautiful time of year here in Australia. So I hope you all get to go out and enjoy the wildlife and the, the low nutrient, amazingly low nutrient <laughs> soils that are in the hills behind Adelaide. And you go walking in there, the diversity is, uh, is really very, very high and uh, very beautiful. So thank you, Bettina, for choosing this time of year. And um, as Uli said, thanks to the um, other people who did a lot of the heavy lifting in this, uh, Joe, Trevor, and um, I've got Lydia there because I was out walking with her as well. She works up in the Plant Accelerator. I'd like to mention Heli as well, without whom really we couldn't have got the Plant Accelerator to this stage, um, certainly in those early days. So we're at a technical conference. It's really driven by technology and by an approach or a series of technologies, an approach of replacing our rulers with fancy bits of equipment which will help us measure things better and faster and more accurately. Um, but it's quite nice that Bettina asked me to talk. Often I'm asked at the end of the conference because then what you do is you wrap everything up by integrating and using the technologies. I'm not really a technologist. I'm just a plant scientist. I'm just a plant guy. And so I like to be applying these technologies. So um, it's, it's a pleasure to kick off with, uh, with some biological context. And to give you the context for my biology, <laughs> I work on salinity tolerance, and the, the reason, well, the, re the honest reason is that I was in Cambridge and I was working on iron transport and I wanted to apply my iron transport to something biological, and so I thought salinity would be something that was of some interest. It turns out salinity is much more important than I realised when I moved into salinity tolerance research, and that's in particular because a lot of the world's food is produced under irrigation, and most of the water that we as humans use on the planet is for agriculture. And most of the water that's used for irrigation is now coming from underground. And certainly that's where most of the growth in irrigation is coming from groundwater. And every aquifer that is being used for irrigation is being depleted. And sometimes those depletion rates are alarming. I'm familiar with northern India, Pakistan, and in that Punjab region, the, the wells are going down by a metre a year. And this cannot go on. And yet this region is feeding like half a billion people. And so we really are in, an, in, a, in a situation where a significant fraction of the world's agriculture is significantly threatened because of the unsustainable extraction of water. But, of course, we're surrounded by water. There's water everywhere. There's water in the sea. Every time you drill or dig a hole, you'll find some sort of water, but most of that water is salty. About 97% of the world's water is salty. And it would be great if we were able to develop technologies and systems where we could unlock the seawater and the other water which we cannot currently use to try to help address this issue of global food security. So I'm wanting to unlock the potential of that huge volume of water that we're not currently not using by growing salt-tolerant plants and by using brackish water or partially desalinized seawater, both by increasing the availability of low-quality water, hand in glove with my engineering friends, and increase the tolerance of crops to salinity, which is, of course, my primary research area, and I use phenomics to do this. And I want to develop systems which are both environmentally sustainable and economically viable. And we'll come back to that in the very last slide of my talk. In the meantime, we're going to discuss the key. If we're going to unlock something, we need a key. And we're very lucky. All the students in this room, you're in a really lucky time to be in plant science now, in biology generally, in fact, because we've got some really exciting new technologies. We have what I call the new genetics, where genomics is truly turbocharging genetics and moving it up to a new level. Just as medicine is facing a revolution powered by personal, um, but by, by genomics, you know, we call it personalised medicine, so too is agriculture. So we can now start genotyping at very high resolution individual plants and thousands of plants at the same time. And if we put that revolution hand in glove with this amazing opportunities that we're going to be discussing in this conference, provided by phenotyping with high throughput characterization of all of those plants that we can now genotype at high resolution and high throughput. This gives us together huge opportunities for innovation. 
So we can start asking questions which were asked back in the 60s and 70s, like this one. How do these Galapagos tomatoes grow in such tough conditions? Well, there were papers written on that in the 70s and work done on that in the 70s with a ruler. And now we can come in and start to ask, re-ask those old questions, but with new technologies, and hopefully start to make some breakthroughs. So I work on salinity tolerance. How do we do this? And why is phenomics relevant? What we're doing is not studying salinity tolerance in toto. When I left Cambridge to come to Australia to really open up my research on salinity, they went, oh dear, that's the end of your career. So you can see they're very encouraging. And that was because salinity tolerance research really was a bit of a black hole. It really did have a lot of difficulties, and this is because the traits the trait of salinity tolerance per se is complex, multigenic, with impossibly you know, multifarious G by E interactions. And so what we're doing is not studying the genetics of salinity tolerance in toto, but we're studying the genetics of traits that we hypothesize are likely to contribute to salinity tolerance. And these are traits which we can phenotype with high resolution and high um, ease using these new technologies that, frankly, you all know a lot more about than I do, but that I like to use. So I'm taking generally a, a forward genetic approach where I'm looking at naturally occurring variation of plants, not mutation-based variation, but naturally occurring variation, and looking for the basis, the genetic basis for the differences, those differences in variation that are naturally occurring. Why don't I use de novo mutation? Of course, there are roles for de novo mutation in science and, and in plant improvement, crop improvement. Um, but for me, if we're looking at something which is, I don't know how to say this really well, I should by now, but <laughs> it's something which is very physiological and very complex, um, like salinity tolerance. Um, I think that if we, if we find traits which are already out there, then they're less likely to come with deleterious secondary effects. And because they've already been subject to either natural selection if they're a wild plant or artificial selection if they're a crop variety or even land race. And so I think if we find traits that come from natural variation based studies, we're less likely to have, when the plants are in, in, in the real field with the real crop, deleterious secondary effects. And then this brings us on to the fact that we can use natural variation much more than we used to be able to because we have genomics helping power genetics. So we can now access variation in wild relatives. We're not just confined to the gene pools in advanced germplasm. The third aspect in my program is that I'm studying salinity tolerance. It's probably better to work with stuff that is already salinity tolerant. So looking at, for example, Arabidopsis or rice, which are two of the most salt sensitive plants on the planet, Studying salinity tolerance of those is sort of a little bit dumb in a way, even though I do it, and I'm going to show you half my talks on Arabidopsis and rice because they're damn useful plants. But, so we, we, but I think that's a bit of a compromise in some of my research and some of our research, and we always have to make some compromises, but I'm trying more and more to work with salt-tolerant plants, and the three species I've been focusing on are barley, tomatoes, and quinoa all pretty salt-tolerant plants already. And then you might say, well, why bother working with them? Because they're already salt-tolerant, Professor Tester. Well, <laughs> no, just because something's good doesn't mean we can't make it better. And remember, I'm wanting to access seawater. If we could even grow crops in the sea, that really would be, in seawater, that really would be amazing. Um, I used to say that that's impossible. We've got to obey the laws of physics and so on. But open your eyes, Mark Tester. You go out there, you do see a lot of plants actually growing in the sea. And there are even crop relatives that are growing in seawater. And uh, this, these, these could potentially be important. There was a paper actually in, what was it, in Nature Biotechnology or Nature Genetics, just in the last couple of days. Oh, it's Nature Plants, where they gene edited about three genes and you know, moved a wild plant, I think it was a Physalis, well towards domestication with, with a single gene editing set of events. Okay, so we're going to measure traits that can be easily phenotyped. And here we've got a balance, what I say here, detail and precision with cost and speed. 
So we want to make things as accurate as possible um, and as detailed as possible, because then you're more likely to get good genetic signals. But you've got to balance that with making things as cheap as possible so you can measure thousands of plants and as fast as possible so you can measure thousands of plants. And that balance is something where there's no right answer and you need to try to wiggle your way through a research program or for a PhD student a research PhD. Okay. There's always arguments about whether you should do this work in field or controlled conditions. And for me, um, this is a, a very interesting and complex argument. Again, there's no right answer. When I see papers which say, if it's not done in the field, it's not relevant, I really strongly disagree with this. What you do have to do is validate in the field. And if you are not doing work in the field, you have to be intelligent about it. And you, know, you see papers where people are working in bins and stuff, that's fantastic, but then it's still artificial. And then you can do things in great big tubs, it's still in some levels artificial. But that might not matter if the traits you are measuring are appropriate for that system in which you are working. So we can work in tiny little pots sometimes. We can work with barley in little pots. And that's fine if you're just working with a seven-day-old seedling and measuring traits in that. Obviously, there's still a level of artificiality, but it doesn't matter. It gives you a fighting chance of being able to get something through that might have relevance in the field. But if you're going to make great claims about your work, of course, you need to test the significance of those traits in a range of field conditions. OK, I'll leave that last point off and move on. OK, so this is one example of work which was started when Rana Munns walked into my lab when I was still in Cambridge, it was a long time ago now, and had two bags of seed of durum wheat, and uh, one of the bags had, uh, the plants had about a fifth to a tenth of the sodium accumulation in a 10-day-old leaf blade uh, compared to uh, the other variety. And it turned out that this uh, variety that had low sodium was an old cross that had been done by a PhD student back in the late 1960s uh, to introgress novel G uh, um, uh, biotic stress tolerance genes. And they had accidentally introduced a gene, uh, a sodium transporter, which is expressed around the xylem vessels of the plants and removes sodium from the transpiration stream before the sodium gets to the shoot and leads to a much lower accumulation of, shoot of sodium. So that little sentence I just said before was about 10 or 15 years of research um, by a series of victim students and, um, and other, other workers uh, in, in both Rana's group and mine. In particular, Caitlin Burt made some great breakthroughs. And uh, this, this uh, sodium... Uh, this decrease in shoot accumulation of sodium led to some fantastic results. Now, I've got a pointer here. Yes, it does sort of work. That's unfair on you guys. Okay, I don't know where to go now. <laughs> Let's start on this side. Uh, the key point about this is that you can do, you can integrate this, you get near isogenic lines. This is work primarily done at CSIRO. And um, get near isogenic lines and grow the plants in, um, with and without the presence of the allele that was giving the high salinity tolerance, and then grow this in fields in low salt parts of the field, moderate salt parts of the field, and high salt parts of the field. And there's two really good results on this graph. One is that in the low salt parts of the field, there's no yield penalty. And that's very important if you want this to be adopted by breeding programs, especially with something like salinity, where fields are often, like you see here, highly heterogeneous. Some bits of the field can be low in salt and just a 100, 200 kilometers away, there'll be a very high salt part of the field. In fact, the distances can be a lot less than that. But what the beautiful result was that when the plants have been grown in very high salt parts of the field, there was a 25% yield increase conferred by the presence of that single gene, which was leading to this low shoot accumulation. That's fantastic. It's a great result. You sort of wonder why I don't just retire and shut up. Uh, the problem <laughs> is that this result is only relevant to the very high salt parts of the field. Here, the yield is three tonnes per hectare. Down here, the yield is one tonne per hectare. The plants are half dead. And sure, you get a result which is 25% yield increase. It's a fantastic result, but it's not going to really help feed the world. It's only relevant for those very high salt parts of the field where the plants are only going from one to 1.25 tonnes per hectare. <clears throat> so we need to do some more. And that's, of course, what we're doing. I mean, it's a nice result and it's nice science, but we need to do a lot more if we're going to feed the world. And why this result might be, we don't really know why the gene is only effective. So I'm just going to give a little bit of hand-waving, which may or may not be right, probably isn't right. 
But what we have here is a relationship between sodium exclusion, uh, sorry, sodium exclusion and salinity tolerance, where lines which are different accessions of these are tetrapoid wheats, um, where lines that are able to maintain low shoot sodium are lines which are better able to maintain yield. But on that y-axis, A, this is tetrapoid wheat, not bread wheat, so this may be a reason why the relationship is upheld. But it may also be because the plants here have been reduced in their growth by, you know, 90 to 70 per cent, so quite a large reduction in yield, um, in growth. Whereas over here, when we did bread wheat and we were more gentle with the plants, reducing the growth by about one third to one half, rather than one third to you know, 90 per cent, what we found was no relationship between sodium exclusion and salinity tolerance. I'm, I'm, I suspect both of these results are right, and it's just what we see, and maybe this is why, when you look in the previous slide, it may be why in this previous slide you don't get an effect of salinity tolerance on yield when the yield is reduced by about one third, but you do when the yield is being reduced by about two thirds. So you're moving from you know, this, the situation that's in this graph to the situation that is in this graph. Okay, doesn't really matter. The point is that when you do see a lack of relationship between sodium exclusion and salinity tolerance, that doesn't mean that sodium exclusion isn't important, but what it does mean is that there are other traits which are also very important in determining this naturally occurring genetic variation which we observe in salinity tolerance, in this case in bread wheat. So Rana Munns many years ago was saying that there are two different types of salinity tolerance. There's the tolerance which is related to ions accumulating in the shoot. And plants can tolerate to different levels um, salinity because they've got different abilities to exclude the sodium, like what I've just been talking about, and different uh, levels of ability to tolerate the sodium which they have failed to exclude. And the obvious example in that is comparing wheat and barley. Wheat really can accumulate 20, 30, 50 millimolar sodium in the shoot and then it starts struggling. Barley it can accumulate 200 millimolar sodium in the shoot and still do well. There's clearly very big differences between wheat and barley in their tissue tolerance. But then there's another, and that's clearly important, but there's another component which I'm going to talk, discuss for a bit now, which Rana observed with John Passura a long time ago, back in the 1980s, where they observed a very rapid inhibition of wheat leaf blade elongation upon addition of sodium to the shoots. And that could be compensated, at least in part, by pressuring the soil and the root part, root half of the plant. So they were suggesting that there were uh, potentially hydraulic signals or something to do with the osmotic component of the salinity that was being added to the soil that was inhibiting within minutes of addition of the sodium, the leaf blade elongation. So you get a very rapid inhibition of sodium, which is independent of the accumulation of sodium in the shoots. And so this we now call the shoot iron independent tolerance, which has a very unfortunate acronym. I won't repeat in polite company. But what we have here is osmotic and ionic tolerance is being separated. And what we can do is start to measure these using phenomics and phenotypic um, approaches. So what I'm going to report here is some results using equipment from PSI um, in collaboration with PSI at their facility in the Czech Republic. And uh, my PhD student here, Mariam Alia, uh, one of my five or six Saudi female PhD students I have in my lab, she developed a technique where we were able to measure at high throughput the salinity. Uh, applying the salinity to Arabidopsis grain soils actually with Xavier's I think it was Xavier, made the suggestion how to apply the salinity for, the, for these plants and these trays. It's very good. And what we have is a series of traits uh, which can be measured by Mariam, which are summarised in the... Well, that's, this is some of the traits. The plants change colour within an hour of adding sodium to the soil. The greenness changes measurably and quantifiably above ground. And you also get various changes in various traits of um, photosynthetic fluorescence. Um, and she managed to accumulate in total uh, quite a large number of different traits over time and in the absence and presence of sodium and so on and ends up starting to collect, like we are all aware with phenotyping, 
very, very large amounts of data very, very quickly. And so that's why you've all got a sticker. And if you don't have a sticker, I'll give you one later. So the sticker is of a farting unicorn. It's farting a rainbow. It's very pretty. And this is, dealt, uh, this is all done by my students. You can tell this is student stuff, not me. So what we have here is an app which is very, very useful, very powerful. We've developed it over the last couple of years in my lab. It's derivative statistically, but it's very, very handy for 90% of us who are not you know, using advanced statistics to help us access some level of high quality statistical analysis and help us manage large numbers of, of data sets. So I really commend to you that MV app. Uh, grab a sticker, give it to your students, Put it on your computer and, and use it because it is very good. So that's actually just been submitted to Plant Cell because Magda gave a talk and then she got invited twice to submit the manuscript to Plant Cell. So using these types of tools and using very high density markers in collaboration with Arta Korta, what Mariam has started to find, so that's a, that's a marker every 30 nucleotides on average with a big association mapping population. You can go straight to genes pretty quickly, not all the time, but a lot of the time. And this is an exciting stage, I think, in, in plant genetics. So for example, here, there's a very strong signal at the distal end of the long arm of chromosome one for the ability of the plants to maintain FV over FM in salt compared to control conditions. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into detail that she's about to submit a manuscript, but uh, I think it just gives you an example of how you know, one PhD student who started with not knowing anything has been able to really go a long way in a pretty short time using some of these phenotypic and genotypic genomic driven um, analyses. Okay, so that's all very well. But I was also thinking in the background about a time when Victor Sadras walked into my office uh, quite a few years ago now. And Victor's here in the audience somewhere. Victor's here. He's a shy guy. So. <laughs> so look for Victor. He's a real thinker and a very, very good scientist. And he said to me, okay, this, this Munz, it was after Munns and Tesla was published, and he looked, said, that's all very well, but there's other ways you could look at salinity tolerance. And he was absolutely right. And he reminded me of the Passiura equation for water use efficiency, where you can say that yield can be a component of transpiration, or can be a, a product of how much the plants transpire, how efficiently the plants produce biomass for the transpiration that they um, undergo, and how efficiently the plants allocate the biomass that they have produced, oh, there you are, Victor, <laughs> to, for, for yield. And so Victor reminded me of this, of this equation and, and, and said, why don't you look at the effect of salinity on each of those three components? So this isn't saying that the, the, Munns, the Munns and Tess or whatever paradigm is wrong, but it's just saying that you can look at plants in other ways as well to study the effect of salinity and the genetic basis for the effect of salinity on components that contribute to yield, which is what we're ultimately interested in. So that was part of the driver, really, for building the plant accelerator, so we could measure in that facility plants growing every day and plants transpiring every day. And then you could start to measure in real time at least two of the three components of that Passiura equation. And I think studying yield in pots is pushing the friendship too far, but I think for at least middle-aged plants or younger plants, being able to study those components, the effect of salinity on those is valid. And certainly I should say that if you're wanting to do experiments in the field and study responses of plants, dynamic responses of plants to something like salinity, I, I don't think that's very practical and very environmentally friendly either. So here's an example of one of the experiments we've done in the, in the, in the accelerator, which actually was published in Nature Comms just over a year ago, done by another one of my Saudi female PhD students, Nadia Al-Tamimi. And she grew plants, rice plants, in waterlogged conditions and measured their growth and their transpiration and measured, calculated things like transpiration use efficiency in, um, in, in plants grown in the absence and presence of salt and then was able to look at the effect of salinity on transpiration use efficiency. She did this in over 500 genotypes, which had been genotyped at high resolution by a group led by Susan McCooch, and was then able to start to look at um, the genetic 
control because some plants were able to maintain their transpiration use efficiency in saline conditions relative to control, and others were really poor at maintaining their transpiration use efficiency. And the same for transpiration. I mean, plus all those other things like the Munns and Testa mob we're trying to look at. And this is one example of one of the, um, one of the uh, genetic loci on chromosome 11 that, uh, that, that Nadia has seen. And I should say, I'm not being secretive by not telling you what the gene is. We're actually wanting to validate the genes, and it's still three, four, five genes sometimes in the, in the, in the region of interest. And I've now got a new set of victims, students, who are now looking at, uh, at, 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 at you know, doing the reverse genetic, it's essentially a reverse genetic characterization of the candidate genes in those loci. Plus, most of the time, they're things like unknown gene or transcription factor or protein kinase or something. So I can see that we've still got several years ahead of us before this work actually starts to get really exciting. But I like, you know, for this conference, I think it's, in, it's good that we can actually do this. So this is just an example of what you can do. Um, of course, then you might say, well, that's all very well to measure transpiration use efficiency and the effect of you know, genetic control of plant responses you know, with two salinity on transpiration use efficiency. Is it relevant? The answer is we don't know. We're still trying to do the field trials and try to do studies. Doing salinity field trials in the field is really, really difficult, especially for rice. We can do it for things like, um, well, I'll show you in a minute, other plants where we use drip irrigation in the Middle East on a deep sandy soil in a very good situation to do that. But for rice, we're struggling still. We have a very good collaboration with Babukar Mane in Africa Rice. And <laughs> actually, I showed this to a crop physiologist recently. He said, it's amazing you've got any correlation. What there was, I have no idea what it means, but we did measure a correlation between harvest index in the, um, in the field with transpiration rate measured in the plant accelerator. As I say, I don't know if there's any meaning in that, but that's what we have observed so far. Okay. Ah, yeah, okay, this is just advertising some work. No? What's wrong? <laughs> You're present okay, so Bettina's presenting this on Thursday, so come to her talk, because uh, we, all we've done so far really is just count pixels and count green pixels and brown pixels. And All right, we're starting to do some stuff with fluorescence in Arabidopsis, but um, we can also look at the structure of the plant in more and more detail. And so using um, machine vision and computer vision technologies, we're able to start to dissect the plant and not just look at how many pixels the plant's producing, but how many pixels for leaf three, leaf four, leaf five through time. So Bettina's gonna talk about that on Thursday, which is great. So going back to the field, having a little look at some salt tolerant plants for once <laughs> in my talk. This is a, a relative of, 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 of tomato. In fact, it's probably the closest wild relative to tomato. And we just accidentally found that this plant was very, very salt tolerant. And so there's about 326 accessions available that I could find, get my hands on in the world of this plant. And we're now you know, through various disasters and accidents and so on, we're down to about growing 200 of these. And we've now done this for three years in the field, growing about 200 to 250 lines in, of this Selenum pimpinella folium in the field under drip irrigation in a sandy soil where we're drip irrigating with low salt or high salt. And we actually do a real replication. So we have two control plots and two um, high salt plots. There's a thousand individual plants which are all hand planted, hand weeded and hand harvested. That's the current slave, PhD student, who's been doing all of that work, Mitch Morton. And it's in collaboration with one of our local Saudi universities, uh, with this Egyptian guy, Magdi Musa, who's just a man giant. He's wonderful to work with. And we also genotype these plants um, using GBS. We're actually a just like, literally this week got the DNA prepared to um, completely just resequence them all using shallow resequencing because this GBS genotyping wasn't satisfactory. But Mitch, with his preliminary analyses, is starting to find some salinity tolerance loci, which is very exciting. However, that, that, this picture down the bottom, you some, might think that's not a very good picture of a tomato plant. That's actually reconstituted from drone images. So we've now got sub-centimeter reconstitution of these plants so we can watch them growing through time, just like we're in the plant accelerator. Okay, the other plant, the other salt torrent crop that we're starting to work on is quinoa. To be honest, I first thought of working on quinoa because it's a salt torrent plant, so I thought it would be a salt torrent model. It's very salt torrent. You still get a, 
or maybe one or two tonnes per hectare, uh, irrigating it with uh, half seawater in the field. I say maybe because you can measure two, but then that's in plots. So I don't know how that's going to scale up. We haven't quite got to that, that level of experiment yet. But in the process of doing this, I realised that um, quinoa is actually a very interesting plant. We've got a massive potential for becoming a really new major crop. The problem is it's still barely domesticated. It's tall, it falls over, it branches, it's got variable panicles, variable maturities, a day length sensitivities, it's got all sorts of things which are disastrous for a world crop. Um, and so I've got a little bit carried away and diverted, I must say, by trying to start to do some um, like um, traditional, if you like, breeding approaches to try to improve and fully domesticate quinoa. But you can do this on steroids now as well be, by using plant phenotyping and by using genomics. So we're actually resequencing a thousand quinoa accessions uh, and, and, and we're planting them in as many different places in the world as we can. So we're developing a core collection of about 400 accessions and then we've got the full set. The full set's about 1,300 accessions. Genotyped about a thousand of those by resequencing. So we can do about five fold um, coverage. You can resequence a genome now for $100. It's really not getting crazy. Um, and so, uh, as I say, for students, we're in a very exciting time. So we can now, uh, using uh, you know, uh, field plots and, uh, and, and drone technologies, we can now start to genotype these plants and phenotype them, sorry, phenotype them pretty well. And so we've now got field trials. This is one of our two field trial sites in China, which is in collaboration with a company, Jiaqui Kinwa in Shanxi province, uh, led by David Wu. And so this is a field trial plot actually up on the Tibetan plateau. And, um, and then we've got a field trial plot actually in Shanxi province itself in northern China. And uh, yeah, that, that's, that's just sort of telling you what we're doing with quinoa. And this example of barley, where the work is much more advanced, uh, done by a PhD student, Stephanie Saad. And uh, this is using a NAM population, a nested association mapping population. So one of the problems, I sit here saying, hey, we can access wild, wild germplasm. Well, <laughs> that's fine. But for barley, that doesn't work so well because a wild barley shatters and it lodges and it really doesn't work very well. So the way to do this is to make a compromise. And you get maybe, in this case, 25 wild relatives and cross them into the same mother line so you end up with 25 families, 25 sets of small biparental mapping populations with the same mother. And that leads to this thing called a nested association mapping population. This was built originally by Klaus Pillen in Germany and genotyped with reasonable density. This works a couple of years old now. And so we we're able in the Middle East um, to, to plant in collaboration with Mohammed Shahid at Iqba in Dubai. We're planting and harvesting about half a million plants in this field. It's quite a big field, actually. And uh, irrigate them with low salt and high salt. And Stephanie did the genetic analysis on this and found a very interesting locus. I say I've been doing for 32 minutes. <laughs> so um, a genetic locus here at the uh, distal end of chromosome 2, which she's now zooming in on. Uh, and this, this locus actually comes. It's incredible. This locus, we did all this fancy, you know, get 25 fathers and all this sort of business. The actual locus is found in one of the 25 fathers. And that's pretty impressive that we were able to measure that above all the other noise that would have been introduced to the population for the other 24 fathers. But it all came from one individual collected from northwestern Iraq. And that led to a 30% increase in yield under saline conditions. And that I have, I'm really pleased because I now validated that for us. For, for for a third year with just that biparental mapping population. So it actually looks quite exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm happy when you keep seeing the same result over again. The weird thing is in parallel with that NAM population, we also ma um, planted an association mapping population and blow me down, got the same signal. Um, and it was actually exactly the same SNPs. So that also makes you think that this, this locus might be real. And so we really are trying to push in and identify the gene. They're the candidate genes for what they're worth. We're trying to just validate these at the moment. We're also crossing it into several commercial barley lines. OK. OK, drones. I think you will know more about this than I do. So this is, I've got a fantastic collaboration in Kaust with an engineer 
That's who you need to work with. You need to collaborate with statisticians. You need to work with computer vision people. You need to work with engineers. And this is an engineer who, bless him, says he's interested in what we do. So he makes a collaborator from heaven. And uh, he knows how to drive all of these machines. He also uses CubeSat data now to, 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 genotype, to, to phenotype fields, which is outrageous. But the resolution and the time, the, the frequency of passing of CubeSats now is high enough to be able to get real-time information. And it's cheap. I mean, you have to subscribe. Obviously, it's a bit of money, but you can get a lot of data for your money. So um, in the meantime, before you get too excited by CubeSat, uh, we have here, uh, he's flying hyperspectral camera on a big brute of a drone. And you know, you can get reasonable. You have to do your flight pans very carefully and have spare batteries and all this sort of stuff. But we're able to cover uh, from a reasonable height with a reasonable resolution, a reasonable area like our tomato field. So we've set them across our tomato field now for the last um, couple of years, and they're starting to collect data. And of course, the data management and the data analysis is the primary problem. Um, uh, I, yeah, it needs some skill, of course, and experience to fly the drones and fly them well, but uh, it's the data analysis. So you, you plan the campaigns, you do the field data collection, the ground truthing, and you've got to analyze the data. And when you're doing hyperspec, this starts to become very, very computationally demanding. So fortunately, we have a supercomputer as well, and we're able to reconstitute, you know, with 200 odd wavelengths at sub-centimeter resolution, views of tomato plants, uh, and do it over and over again. So we've actually developed a hyperspectral workflow. This is mainly done by one PhD student, a young Colombian woman, where we're able to, yes, collect the data and ground truth it, able to process the data and do all of that uh, very complex post-capture analysis and then start to try to understand it. And we're now increasingly, one more minute, Bettina, we're increasingly uh, using machine learning. And I can't go into this now because I must be quiet, but it really is powerful. And I think we're really in a new, we're on the cusp of a new era in plant science where guys like me, now, I'm a plant physiologist, as Bettina said by introduction. You know, so we can sit there and say, oh, I think that this is the way uh, plants, and we should be analyzing like this. Sure, that's OK. And then Victor Sadras comes in and tells me I should be doing it this way. Oh, sorry, Victor, that's an unfair paraphrasing. And then we do it, and that's fine. But I think we're now going to take another step back and start to really, the, the more I learn, the more I get to know, the more I know I don't know. And I'm really starting to leave this now to the machines. And we actually are doing this. And so with machine learning and unbiased selection of models, I think we're going to start to move into a new era where we're going to start doing genetics. We are starting to do genetics on parameters that I don't understand, that only the machine and that the machine has selected. The physiological basis for which I have no idea, but it doesn't matter because it's going to point us to the genes and it's going to point us to the alleles. And then we can validate that we can intergress, make near isogenic lines, and go out to the field and then see if it is actually relevant to yield maintenance. And I think that's the new way to go. And on that note, I'm going to retire. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm going to do something else. What I'm going to do <laughs> is deliver some of our research for real. At the very beginning, I said I want to develop systems which are environmentally sustainable and economically viable. So I think some of our work now is sufficiently advanced, especially on the engineering side, to put my neck on the block. And so we've set up a company, we've incorporated in the US and we are incorporating in the Middle East, where we are trying to develop saltwater-based greenhouses where we're growing salt-tolerant tomatoes and we're delivering our salt tolerance very rapidly through grafting. In a greenhouse that's cooled with seawater, where the roof is cleaned with no water, and we are able to replace, depending on the weather and the situation, 80 to 95% of the fresh water that is used in our greenhouse with seawater. And given we are in the Middle East, where most of that fresh water that's used has come from desalination, the impact on the carbon footprint as well is enormous. And so we're now at the stage of building a prototype, a small 2,000 square meter greenhouse. And uh, with that, we should be able to develop the, the, the engineering and the systems, and then hopefully be able to scale up to like a 20 hectare greenhouse, which is what you really need. So, that's my next little project. So using sand and sea and the revolution in both genetics and phenomics, 
I think we can now develop new agricultural systems and make a contribution to global food security. I'd just like to end by thanking, I still thank the people here in Adelaide uh, where my salinity research really started, in particular Stuart, Bettina, Sonia and Sandra who've been my deputies in various laboratories. And I'd like to thank the funders of course, I'd like to thank you all for listening and I'd just like to say that we're recruiting. We're recruiting full professors. We're growing quite fast at the moment. We're on a bit of a roll. And so we've just recruited Rod Wing. Uh, he's coming to, and uh, we've got another top plant breeder joining us, we hope. And we're also wanting to recruit postdocs um, for the uh, drone work. So thank you very much. Thanks.